tax exempt status, generally it's a 501c3, but there are some other categories as well, that um, if your, your uh, uh, economic activity was less than $25,000 a year, you were not required to report. Once it passed that threshold, then you had to file your 990 every year. And that's the way it was. Well, uh, through some rulemaking and some legislative changes back in, I believe it's 2006, uh, a fairly simple but nonetheless strict standard was put in place that you have to notify them every year uh, that you're still in business and that you're you know, below that, uh, that uh, dollar uh, ceiling or threshold. And these are the small, you might say mom and pop organizations that do good things but not, not huge issues. And many did not find, uh, find out about it and despite the fact that the recommendation to the IRS was that they then suspend their tax-exempt status, instead they revoked it. And they told you after the fact. Here's how I found out about it. Uh, a few months ago, um, a constituent of mine up in Loveland who runs a small nonprofit, it's called the Computer Museum. They collect old computers that have become obsolete and literally save them for posterity. Um, about the only expenses they have is the storage space that they, they have for it. And uh, he got a notice, I'd say it's probably in February, that the IRS had, had revoked his tax status back in May of 2011, I might add, just you know, for a good measure that's at that. He goes to the website for the IRS and it state, stated very clearly on the site, and, and this is all pretty much spelled out in, in the, uh, the memorial, that they'll notify you if you miss a, a, uh, an annual filing. They don't do that. He called on two different occasions and talked to somebody in the IRS, and in and both cases, they, he was told, uh, no, we don't do that. Yeah, it's up on the website, but we just don't do that. Um, and as he described this to me, I thought, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. Um, but I'm going to say it's sad. What can I do there? Well, what we can do is we can appeal to Congress. I've also talked to my member of Congress, uh, uh, Cory Gardner, and would recommend those, you know, those of you who think this is an issue worth pursuing, contact your member of Congress, too. Uh, they can fix this if they want to. Congress has a great deal of latitude in a lot of areas, and they assume a lot more than I think they have. But in this area, I think they have not only the ability, but the responsibility to do this. Why do I say this? Because it's happened to, by the best of our estimates, tens of thousands of organizations across the country. Uh, just last week, a week ago today, I was at a breakfast up in Larimer County, and I was describing it from the table I was at. The gentleman beside me, who's an older gentleman, uh, turned to me and said, yeah, that was me. I said, what? He said, well, back in 1985, he formed a small nonprofit that was kind of a ministry to people who have needs. He said, somebody would give us a car, we'd fix up the car, and we'd give them, you know, give the car away to, to a, uh, you know, a single mom, or, or somebody would be behind on their, their heat payments, uh, you know, their, their utility payments. and, and he said, we didn't give them money, but we would pay their bills. And uh, he said, and then I got this notice from the IRS just earlier this year that, uh, that they changed the rules, that I didn't know about it, and I'm now out of business. And this has happened far too many times. Uh, hence, I bring before you Senate Joint Memorial 3 and uh, ask for your favorable consideration. You open that. Thanks. Just out of curiosity, Senator Lumber, did you ask Representative Gardner if he would contact the rest of the delegation? Because it seems to me both sides would be interested in helping with this. Just out of curiosity. Uh, Representative. Uh, Who did you say? Congressman. Oh, uh, I have not followed through with that yet, but I assure you I shall. Yeah, because that's. Um, yeah, I had. To, I, I don't know what it's like when you're speaking with your member of Congress, but usually it's a brief conversation. And I followed up with his staff a couple of times just to make sure that they're up to speed on this. But, uh, uh, and I'm hopeful. I know that just one sheet of paper, maybe two, coming from the Colorado uh, General Assembly to Congress doesn't have a lot of effect, but, but an issue that has affected people all over the country 
I think maybe it just needs somebody to pack that snowball right and then start rolling down the hill, and I should hope that we're the folks to do that. I'm not sure I'd throw it at somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you have Mr. Turner from the Colorado Nonprofit Association who wants to speak on behalf of this. Is, can I call him? Please do. Okay. Mr. Turner. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Mark Turner. I'm the manager of public policy for Colorado Nonprofit Association. Um, we're here to testify in support of Senate Joint Memorial 3. Um, we represent over 1,300 nonprofits throughout the state, and our mission is to lead, serve, and strengthen Colorado nonprofit organizations. Um, I'd like to thank um, Senator Lundberg for bringing this resolution forward. I would also um, like to thank Mr. Charles of the Carver Computer Museum for helping to um, really bring some more focus to this important issue. Um, just to give some more background, back in 2005 there was a panel on the nonprofit sector convened um, to take a look at um, governance and accountability issues for the nonprofit sector. Um, this, count, this panel was convened at the urging of um, Senator Grassley and the Senate Finance Committee. So they made the recommendations about the um, annual electronic notice for nonprofits who um, have budgets of $25,000 and under. Um, previously, those organizations had been exempt from filing. Um, and the reason for that recommendation was to provide some um, accurate public information on nonprofits that are eligible for tax deductible contributions from donors. Um, the other recommendation was for suspension rather than revocation of tax exempt status for nonprofits who fail to meet their annual filing requirements for three consecutive years. Um, this was another measure to help ensure compliance with federal reporting um, and um, nonprofits would be ineligible for tax exemption or tax deductible contributions until suspension was cured. So, um, Congress uh, took a look at those recommendations um, and determined rather than um, taking the recommendation for suspension um, that, um, that, that uh, those organizations would be, um, their tax exempt status would be automatically revoked if they failed to file for three consecutive years. Um, so back in 2006, um, this requirement uh, for uh, small organizations to file and the automatic revocation requirement came in at the same time. So there was a whole group of nonprofit organizations that were you know, newly required to file at that time. Um, to date, um, the revocation list with the IRS, there are about 435,000 organizations on that list. And these are just tax exempt organizations in general. Um, and about 16,000 have reapplied for tax exemption since that time. Were organizations that were still in business, but um, took the steps to reapply and restore that tax exemption. Um, one of the challenges with the federal law is that um, because the law requires a master revocation list to, to be kept, and the IRS uses that as a historical record, even if an organization restores its tax exempt status, it's still listed both on the revocation list and on the list of organizations eligible for. Um, so it leads to some confusion for donors, but um, we think that that is something that hopefully this, the recommendations of this memorial will help with. Um, getting to the memorial, what we are saying in this is, first of all, to require timely reminders of nonprofits when they miss their filing deadline and to give them notice on revocation so that way it's they're not suddenly getting a letter from the IRS that their tax exempt status was revoked when they not aware that they needed to file in the first place. Um, and um, the second recommendation was to require suspension rather than um, revocation to go back to that recommendation of the panel. Um, that way, nonprofits will not have to start over and reapply for tax exempt status, um, and they'd still have to take some steps to be able to restore um, their status if they happen if they fail to file for. I think that, I think, really kind of gets across the point. It's a little, from our standpoint, uh, we encourage your support of that as a would-be amendment. And um, I am happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks, Mark. And 
I, I know uh, your boss, Mr. Fagan, is not bashful if, if um, in your education part of, of your work with the nonprofit association, if, if, are your members aware of this in the, in the short term? Well, back in 2010, um, the IRS actually postponed when they would start the relocations from May until October. Um, so there was a media push. Um, we talked to the Denver Post at that time that um, you know we realized that sometimes not you know the message doesn't always get across, and that there was going to be a huge effort need to reach everyone. So for all the organizations that made contact information, we sent out emails, and we did our best to be able to contract all of those organizations individually. Um, you know. Uh, most of them had closed their doors, but there were still some of them that were still in business that we uh, wanted to make sure that we reached out and they knew. So have you guys contacted our delegation as well? Um, we no. have not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have not contacted our delegation to date about this, but we think this is a good step to start. <coughs> I'm just looking at this. Um, Senator Lundberg, we're sending this to each member of, yeah, okay, we are, each member of Colorado's congressional delegation. Okay, I'm sorry I missed that line. We are doing that, so I think that's critical. Yes, Senator Lundberg. If I could just note, uh, if their office is like mine, a phone call is much more efficacious than just a letter, though. Yes. You know, in, in <coughs> I'm sure, you know, between all of us, uh, all of us do know all of the delegation, uh, I'm sure. But so yeah. things like that would be uh, appropriate. But uh, first, we have to determine the will of the legislature here. Yep, right. I agree. Senator Boyd. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mark, would, is there any retroactivity involved in this memorial for, for those organizations that have since had to shut their doors? Um, or do they, would they, if they want to start up, up again, would they need to start up again? Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Boyd. Um, the IRS currently has some processes for organizations to be able to restore retroactivity. Um, the organizations have to establish a reasonable cause, which for 2012, at least, there is um, the IRS is offering what's called transitional relief, which consists of um, a reduced filing fee for their Form 1023. Um, also, um, just presumption that you know presumption of reasonable cause by using that um, filing process. So it would allow the organization to be able to retroactively uh, re you know, restore that tax exempt status for. Um, during that period of time. So if they act now, the small organizations do have that relief. Um, that same relief is not going to be available to the larger organizations. And I think going forward, it's going to be, you know, the organizations are going to have to establish a reasonable cause. They're not going to get that break on their 1023 filing fee. Um, but regardless of um, the process right now, um, every organization has to file Form 1023 and be applied for tax exempt status. Any other questions, Mr. Turner? Thanks, Mark. Is there anyone else who would like to testify on Senate Joint Memorial 3? Seeing none, first public testimony, and turn the floor back to you, Senator Lumber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of uh, additional facts that uh, I'd like to pass through the way. First, um, it's, it's been difficult to determine just how many have been affected, uh, but, but this I do know, and that is uh, that uh, if, if you go to the IRS website and just ask how many organizations in total that have tax-exempt status have had that revoked, uh, you get a list of uh, nationwide 400, uh, let's see, let me get my decimals right here, 432,873, or if you go to the state of Colorado, um, 8,452. And then, as uh, uh, Mark made reference to uh, Mr. Charles, he's the uh, computer museum guy, who 
uh, boiled that down to the, to the town of Loveland, where he's from and, and I represent, and he found 84 there. And that was a number that was a little more manageable, and so he went through and tried to identify, and we, we, we figured out that within Loveland, about 20% of the, those 84 were actually uh, uh, affected by this ruling uh, or by this, uh, uh, this regulation. And uh, some have already been working through the process, which uh, the, the filing fee normally is $800. I, I believe that I was told that it was that they lowered that to 400, which is still a pretty high standard for a small nonprofit. Uh, in, in my world outside of the legislature, I do media production, and I focused in on nonprofits. We've been doing it for 30 years. I've worked with dozens of nonprofits, big ones, little ones. Across, all across the country, and I know that the small operation is just as valid, and sometimes it's mo even more efficient and effective because it's so targeted. But these aren't, you know, high-paid CEOs. These are folks who are literally giving their time, their resources, and have, and have found an effective way to help the people around them uh, that just haven't been aware of, uh, of, of this uh, issue. And, it's one of those examples where the federal government has just moved through with its heavy, you know, systems, and a lot of people have been crushed in the process. And, and specifically, how it would work out is up to Congress. But the first step is to simply say you've got a problem, you need to fix it, and that's what uh, we're wanting to do with this memorial. So, I just quickly glance through, and it looks like what you did on the strike below is just change the whereas is and say. We tried to, it, working with Mark actually, uh, we just tried to clarify it because uh, it's, I'm sure you've been through this with bill drafting, is you come up with your best shot and then somebody else comes in and says, hey, you know, this word here, and this, you move this around, and, and so we just came to the conclusion to, to keep this clean and straightforward and just give you a complete package on, on the strike below, but there is absolutely no intention of changing anything of substance just clarity and, and sometimes greater breadth. <clears throat> we did close public testimony. Okay. Um, we need, a, and we do have an amendment, so we need a motion and, and an amendment. Senator Banks. I move Senate Joint Memorial 3, and I move Amendment 1. Thank you, sir. Is there any objection to Amendment 1? So, no, it is so ordered. And now, any further conversation on the roll? So now we will call the roll. Ms. Jackson. Senator Boyd. Aye. Senator Grantham. Aye. Senator Neville. Aye. Senator Bacon. Aye. Mr. Chair. Aye. This is five. Sir. Um, put memorials on the consent calendar. Or it's been amended. Uh, I yeah, know we're, yeah. we're trying to. Well, that, that's true that we need to do that. But I, I would appreciate 30 seconds on the floor to simply explain what I think is a problem. But, I mean, I'm doing it so that we will bring the attention to the problem. Hopefully, we'll be more effective. I understand that. Promise not to have a knockdown, drag up debate. Uh, I understand <laughs> that, and I think we we all agree with you. And I, I guess as there will be some of us here, if not all of us, that we'll try to help you. Very good. Thank Senator Boyd. Oh, we want you for 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that if you want. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Lumber. <laughs>